Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us in the latest of the Insight Series online. We're really pleased to have today's guest, Dr. Sally Augustin, an environmental psychologist, joining us in the room and online. We will be using the chat box for questions as we look at the subject of designing for every user neurodiversity in the workplace. Sally, thank you for joining us. Over to you. Well, thank you for inviting me. And um, first thing I'd like to do is to introduce myself really briefly. I'm an applied environmental psychologist, and that means I make science-based research uh, design related recommendations to people designing places and objects and services worldwide so i'll talk to people about how high the ceiling should be to create a certain effect what people should feel under their feet to be thinking in a particular way I'll talk to people about how to create an environment the colors textures etc make it more likely that people will think creatively and sense the world is never really quite that simple. I'll also layer in information like that we're going to talk about today, as well as how national culture, organizational culture should influence design, how personality comes into play, and another uh, and a range of other similar factors. Now, I'm also going to take a moment to explain to you our plan for the day, because you know we're gathered here today, that sounds like a wedding, doesn't it? Uh, but we're gathered here today to talk about how sensory processing influences how people think and behave. Because when the information flowing into people's heads is being processed optimally, their performance and well-being gets a boost, and so does that of um, the organizations that they're part of. Um, but there are a number of different ways in which people can process sensory information. And um, if you immediately jump into the weeds of all of those different ways of processing information, people, well, you know, it, you get this sort of overwhelmed feeling because there's so many details that you become aware of and things like that. But when you get a chance and you step back a little bit, you find that um, the spaces where all of us perform to our full potential and live you know, nice lives while we're doing that share 10 different uh, elements, factors. And um, if you keep these in mind, as I'm talking about all the different sorts of um, different sensory processing that can take place, you'll realize that when you're designing with these 10 factors in mind, you create a place where people with differential sensory processing thrive, but so does everybody else. So just you know, to talk about them extremely uh, briefly, um, a space needs to align with the activity planned. If people need to concentrate, to focus, they really need to be able to do that. Uh, you need to provide people with um, uh, choice and environmental control once uh, they've made their choice about where they're going to work, for example. You need to build in opportunities for cognitive refreshment. We all get mentally tired from time to time. Uh, it's uh, best to design biophilically. We could talk for hours on that alone. Um, you want to send the right messages nonverbally that people are, their contributions are valued and respected, for example. You need to reflect national and organizational culture. You need to be green, you know, environmentally responsible, and uh, people need to know you are. When that's the case, performance gets a boost. Um, places need to seem familiar and somewhat predictable. That doesn't mean exactly the same from place to place, but fundamentally familiar. You need to take care with standardization and automation. One size does not fit all. Uh, Michael Brill was a famous um, uh, workplace uh, strategist from, well, he's been dead about 20 years now, but he used to say, if you think one size fits all, take off your shoes and exchange them with the person sitting next to you. So anyway, and the last thing you have to remember is people developing spaces have to realize that um, uh, perception actually is more important 
than reality. Uh, you know, it's very important, the messages that people are taking away from the spaces that you're developing. And I forgot to say this at the beginning, but um, don't worry about like having to photo these slides, particularly the later slides that um, have design-related resources on them, because um, the whole slide deck is, um, is, is going to be available. So you can just um, sit and um, absorb. So there are, in other words, there are real differences in uh, the people and how they'll process information. But for all the uses of the space, no matter how they, their brains function, these same 10 factors should drive design. Now, when we start to think about differences in sensory processing, it's important to bring up where some of those differences can come from. First of all, some people's sensory channels just actually work differently. Someone can be hard of hearing uh, or blind, something on that order. Uh, also, um, there can be um, differences in sensitivity to environmental stimuli generally. There is something called highly sensitive people that we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, an individual can be autistic, and that can influence how they uh, receive and process sensory information. So does having ADHD or uh, dyslexia. There are also personality-based differences in responses to the environment and how environments should be designed. Um, national culture and language come into play in terms of how people experience a space. And um, so does training. So we'll talk at the very end about how uh, the fact that probably most of you have gone to design school, how that des design education makes you atypical. And um, when we're talking about all these things, we have to remember that all these factors are on a continuum. Someone could have more or less vision. You know, uh, people um, can have um, more or less significant ADHD-related issues, et cetera. So everything is always along a uh, continuum. And also, before we go forward, it's important to remember that the people who will be in the workplaces you, you're developing, um, they've been to school, et cetera. So they already have some ideas themselves about how a space um, can best um, accommodate them and um, any issues related. So for very first, as an introduction to this whole topic, we're going to talk about um, differences that might arise through um, sensory channel processing. We're going to talk about uh, being deaf or hard of hearing and how that should influence design. And then we're going to talk about having visual issues or, um, and also colorblindness. So um, there's a university in Washington, DC called Gallaudet. And Gallaudet is the premier institution worldwide for people who are um, uh, hard of hearing. People come from all over the world to go to Gallaudet. And the individuals who design architecturally and interior design for Gallaudet years ago started to pay attention to what they did in spaces where the students thrived, where you know, they got good grades, where they mingled happily with others. And, 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 and they started to codify all this. And now they've developed something they call deaf space. And um, they're very proud of deaf space. It's in the, and they should be. It's a cool system. Like I was at Gallaudet, and you know, they have displays up just in the middle of like the student center about deaf space. So you know, I'm talking about being deaf to start with because it's sort of an easy introduction to thinking about designing for people with sensory differences. So if you're designing for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, you really have to think about sight lines in general and some things you might not consider, like have thought about before, like the natural light flowing into a space. Well, if you're trying to read somebody's lips, you get very concerned. Um, it can be very difficult for you if there's glare, if that person you're speaking with is backlit. Um, it makes it hard to um, figure out what, what, what they're up to. But glass treatments on windows, et cetera, can help with this. And um, so can soft diffuse lighting in general. But if you think about it, you know, like natural light can be oppressive in any environment, no matter, even though it seems to be like sort of a magic elixir to us. So we always have to manage natural light. We can't, always, we can't fill a space, just fill a space with it. Um, again, if you're um, reading someone's lips, you're very concerned about the colors on the walls behind them because you know, their face has to be distinctive. Choosing the right sort of colors to create a mood, 
very, is very important. Um, uh, one of the tenets of deaf space is putting glass panels in indoors. Um, uh, because um, if you don't have any um, acoustic cues, you might start to open a door and open the door into somebody or have a door opened onto you. But if you think about it in today's days, uh, when so many people are doing things like they're on cell phones when they're um, walking and not really cognizant of what's around them, this can be handy for all of us to think about putting glass panels and doors that might be open. And you can make these panels opaque if there's a restroom involved or something like that. You know, if you think about blind intersections, you know, where two circulation routes come together at a right angle, you can see how this could be problematic um, if you, it, it, without any acoustic information. So, you know, it, one of the tenets of deaf space is, um, uh, intersections are always curved, or people empty into a large space and then leave that large space to go somewhere else. Um, uh, people who are deaf are um, uh, need the flexibility to be able to change, adjust their chairs so they can actually see people, other people's faces. But they also particularly are concerned about being approached from the rear as actually all humans are. If you've ever heard about prospect and refuge in biophilic design, this is the exact same principle. We like to feel secure and have a, a view out over the world around us. Uh, and um, when people are walking and hard of hearing, not only do you have to think about the blind intersections, but you also have to realize that if people are talking with their hands, that has uh, implications. For example, people stand further apart from each other. If people have to stop using their hands to open a door, a whole conversation st stops, so that's to be avoided. Um, but also, um, when people are walking and watching the hands of other people, they don't often notice challenges in the environment around them. A challenge could be, for example, a staircase. You know, So you need to build in cues into the physical environment to let people know when something they should be paying attention to is present through something like uh, textures underfoot. And you need to make those textures obviously it, uh, an obvious indicator of, of, what's, of what's to come. If you're trying to warn people about a dangerous situation, having a sort of spiky texture underfoot is great because those spikes uh, uh, bring to mind danger, concern, and um, people are more likely, likely to intuitively understand what's going on, which again is always good with human design. Um, you also have to think about when you're designing for people who are um, deaf, the fact that not all people who are hard of hearing are hard of hearing in exactly the same way. So again, we're always working along a continuum with people who are deaf and with humans um, in general. So if you're interested in learning more about deaf space, again, Gallaudet um, uh, has put, put together a whole package that will introduce you to the related concepts. Now, when people's vision is compromised, it gets to be very important for us to think about other channels, like channel redundancy, if you will, for presenting information. You know, if people can't um, see like uh, where uh, uh, approaching issues that they need to be involved with. Also, if people aren't getting clues about if they're on the right path or not, you know, because they can't see, you have to think about building tactile audio cues into those individuals world. Uh, for, uh, you know, for example, a bigger room sounds different if you're like tapping with a cane or just walking, the echoes are different than a smaller room. It's this kind of cue that's useful uh, to people who are um, uh, visually um, in, in, impaired. And um, just as a point of information, uh, blind people, people who are visually impaired, find uh, cues that come through tactile experiences like a change in texture underfoot more useful than an acoustic cue because if more people enter a room, et cetera, that changes an acoustic uh, situation. As with the, the 
individuals who are hard of hearing, it's particularly important to signal to people who have visual issues when there's something happening that um, they need uh, to attend to. But you have to be concerned about things like high contrast flooring, which um, uh, can um, uh, be difficult for people with limited vision to interpret, just as it is um, uh, for, for, for for many others who are sort of half watching the floor out of the corner of their eye as they're on their phone or doing something else. So you, you need to be careful with high contrast, contrast flooring because of stumbling. Um, you also have to be careful if some areas are more brightly lit and others are dimmer. Um, and you have to be particularly concerned at the transition spaces between those brightly lit spaces and the dimmer spaces. You never want to have anything in that sort of transition area like steps or something like that because you know if your eyes are having difficulty adjusting from one lighting condition to another steps can be very problematic and you know just as you know it won't surprise you to learn that the things i'm talking about at at one scale like room scale are also relevant at a smaller scale for example laying out the the top of a desk you know and 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 last i want to talk about predictability and familiarity. This is really important uh, with humans in general. We like a space that's fundamentally familiar to us, like because we, which means we can understand what we're basically supposed to be doing in this space. And we particularly don't like unpredictable hazards. An unpredictable hazard, if you have impaired vision, is a column, you know? It's easy to sort of miss the column with um, you know, your white cane and end up walking into it. Um, but the general point holds unpredictable and potentially dangerous is a really bad um, combination. I also wanted to very briefly talk about colorblindness uh, because um, we often signal by a color in our society like danger or something you're supposed to pay attention to or a difference in area, like we're going from the blue space to the green space. So we're going from the area for the accounting team to the area for the marketing team, et cetera. This whole, there's many people out there who um, are, are, are colorblind. They miss all those cues altogether. But lots of different programs like Photoshop and other things that are available online um, allow you to convert whatever image, or, you know, plan or whatever you're working with from what would be seen by someone who can see color to what would be seen by someone who is colorblind. So, you know, you can easily consider consider this in the, in, in, in the future. And, um, you know, you're, 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 you're starting to see that um, the only way to really deal with all these concerns is to exercise common sense, give people uh, some control over their experience, some flexibility in how they use the space, particularly when you have multiple users in an area. Now, um, I wanted to talk very briefly about highly sensitive people. Um, and um, if any of you have ever heard the term dyspraxia, um, uh, people who are dyspraxic um, have difficulties with um, motor coordination, and also regularly with um, memory, perception, and processing. And the way you would support a person with dyspraxia in a space is basically how you would support a highly sensitive person in the space. So a highly sensitive person, um, it tends to be more attentive to their environment and more cautious. Um, and in terms of how they process sensory information, it is surprisingly enough because psych people thought up this term. This uh, highly sensitive people actually are highly sensitive. Uh, they um, respond more significantly to negative experiences that they have, but also to positive ones. So something that's a little stressful for somebody else, a little distracting, is very stressful and distracting to them. Uh, something that would be a positive for others, that other people get a positive uh, sort of jolt of energy from, like having plants in a, sp in a space, they get a tremendous boost from those plants in a space. So you might think of just as an easy way to remember this, every reaction being somewhat exaggerated. 
people can have issues with any sort of uh, sensory experience, visual, acoustic, etc. Not everybody would have issues with all, probably. And if you think, start to think about this from a design perspective, the, the way you would deal with this would, is basically to create something like a shelter pod where people would have some acoustic, visual, and olfactory isolation. And when you think about it a little more, you realize that kind of area is actually a great place for people who need to concentrate to go when they need to concentrate because they're working on some sort of project. So if you create what is essentially a, a shelter pod, but you call it something else, sort of like a concentration hub or something like that, and make it available to everybody in the organization, uh, people who um, need it, who are highly sensitive, can go without stigma because anybody could be using this sort of space. So again, providing people choice, some control over their experiences once they're in an environment, which is one of the general tenants, ah, very useful. So lately, we've been hearing a lot about designing for people who are autistic. And again, we have to remember that autism is along a, a, a spectrum. Uh, but it seems that like, at least in the United States, about 2.2% of the adult uh, population is somewhere on the autistic spectrum. Um, and autism affects how people communicate and how they interact with their physical world. And um, there are some positive implications of autism. For example, people who are autistic um, have enhanced ability um, to um, deal with patterns and also to work with um, very complex systems. And something you have to know right away when you're thinking about environments for people who are on the autism spectrum is um, any one person can be more sensitive to some sensory stimulation than people generally are and less sensitive to others. So I could be uh, highly sensitive to visual issues and acoustic issues. And for Nigel, he might be very sensitive to olfactory um, uh, 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 stimulation, but uh, not so much for audio. So, you know, it, it, when you start to think about it, you know, if you have 100 people who are autistic, and by the way, autistic is a really hard word to say. If you're from my part of the world, from Boston, you know, that's a lot of vowels to string together for Boston. But anyway, um, anyway, um, uh, people, um, if you have 100 autistic people in your organization, they could all have different uh, sensory profiles. So again, you need to start to think about, you know, how you can um, deal with this range of conditions. And, um, you know, you, if you think about over and under stimulation, you get started thinking about like the retreat pods, like I was talking about with people who are highly sensitive. Again, if you make them generally available, et cetera, you reduce the stigma, make them available to all. If you're starting to think about how many pods you might like to have at, at schools, where there's whole collections of people on the spectrum, uh, there's um, uh, usually one pod uh, for a class for each classroom of students. You know, there's so if you thought about having one pod for like every twelve autistic employees that you had, that could probably work out pretty well. Particularly since these spaces have other uses; they can be used by people who are trying to isolate to concentrate and stuff like that. So again, just to give you some ideas about specialized um, uh, design for people who are autistic. Again, natural light, you know, like how many times have you been to lectures where people just sort of scream at you over and over again, natural light, natural light, can't have too much, bring in the light, bring in the light. Well, sometimes there really can be too much. Um, people who are autistic um, can have lots of problems with, with natural light particularly if it produces any sort of glare at all, um, and if it creates any sort of shadows, that can be really problematic. So you really want um, to create a space that's a little dimmer than usual, and um, uh, you can use things like blinds, um, uh, clear story windows, 
uh, uh, awnings and matte finishes to help deal with this. And you generally want to have diffused indirect light in general. We start to think about it like what, what human, which of you actually do well in a glary situation? So again, you get, you're getting the idea. Um, you need to keep down the visual clutter for people who are autistic, you know, the, the, the golden uh, median uh, in terms of um, visual complexity is um, an interior, residential interior designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. If you think about the number of colors, patterns, uh, the order in that kind of space, that's moderate visual complexity. But you want to pull that back some for people who are autistic. You really have to think about the audio and visual distractions and particularly audio issues. Even people who aren't hypo or hyper sensitive um, uh, with, uh, who are autistic often have trouble with sounds in general. These can be sounds from equipment that's nearby, uh, for example. So you really have to think about um, shielding between rooms um, it, and some other things to think about with people who are autistic are things like physical safety, uh, you have to worry about sharp edges um, because sometimes balance isn't so good. Um, if you, but if you're trying to work in things like absorbent materials uh, to help with the sound, they can also help uh, you keep people a little safer. You also have to think about things like um, uh, compulsive behaviors. You know, like you, you want to try to not use patterns that readily lead to things like counting. You know, like people who are autistic might like count how many swans there are in a pat in a in a in a, in a wall covering that you put up that's like a pond scene or whatever. And they might they'll actually probably count them over and over again if they count them once. So you want to try to avoid um, stimulation that would um, lead to that sort of repetitive uh, behavior. Uh, floor plans can be really significant to, for people with who are who are autistic, um, they can have a lot of difficulty learning how to navigate a space. So making an obvious, clear um, layout is important. Um, also with straightforward signage. And, you know, when you start to think about floor planning for people who are autistic, uh, it, it very early becomes clear that when you're working with this sort of population, you really want to create zones for different sorts of activities, you know, like a space where this is to be done, a space where that is to be done, et cetera. When you get right down to it, that's actually an aspect of effective wor workplace design generally. You have the space where people are supposed to do focused work, space where people will have this kind of meeting, a space where people will have breaks, et cetera. Um, and with an autistic population, this zoning is not only important because it's just basically important to align design with the task at hand, but it's also important because it helps with the development of routines. And people who are autistic do um, much better. Their um, performance is higher, they feel better about life, et cetera, when they're able to um, establish a routine and keep to it. Um, uh, so, um, uh, you know, uh, also, um, uh, we can think about things like uh, people on the autism spectrum tend to, tend to generally um, prefer very familiar environments, again, because they're interested in maintaining routines. They tend to dislike novelty. And interestingly enough, um, they seem to be less positive about curvilinear design elements than the rest of the population. So if, you, if you're going to be upholstering a sofa in an area that will have lots of autistic individuals working because it's like a tech company or whatever, like ditch the Paisley option, uh, go for something that's more um, geometric. So it, it, I bring that up because it's interesting because you know, there's a lot of uh, psych PhD students and they're doing lots of different projects all the time. And they investigate issues on all different scales. Like somebody actually found that out about people who are autistic, but other people are addressing like more significant issues at a, at a higher scale, like particular uh, sounds and or decibel levels. So you know, like uh, if if you have a question, it's very likely someone out there has researched it. And if you start to go to um, trustworthy, reliable sites online, you can get an answer to your to your question. 
Now, these are two great resources if you're actually um, developing like um, a care facility for somebody who's autistic or some other um, uh, space where there'll be lots of people on the autism spectrum. Uh, the, ver the first book, the Aronson Steele book, um, relates to adults with autism specifically, and the Mustafa uh, reference is much more general, but these are both available free at the websites um, noticed. Noted every so often, one of these websites transitions to something else or whatever. So, you know, again, you'll have option to the access to the slides. If you actually, you know, six months from now try to access one of these things and you can't find it, be in touch. I'll help you find it. You know, it makes it would make you crazy sometimes. I mean, you know, like something will stay at exactly the same website for like five years, and I and I can talk about it, and then it'll change every month for the next five months as a, as websites get get redesigned. So next, we're going to talk about people with attention uh, deficit hyperactivity disorder. And this is about 4.4% of American adults. And um, it's um, characterized by three main factors, hyperactivity, surprise, surprise, again, in the name, who would have guessed, um, uh, impulsivity, uh, and often uh, regular inattention, but people with ADHD are also really quick to respond to environmental stimuli, and there's research indicating that they actually might be more creative than the rest of us. So um, it might seem like what you should do with people with ADHD is sort of basically put them in a box, right, and protect them from the whole world around themselves. And by the way, this morning when I gave this talk, somebody asked what this box was, and I can tell you it's a work site that you can rent by the minute in O'Hare, O'Hare Airport in Chicago. Um, and I forget the name of the company that actually owns it, but you, know, like you pay with a credit card right at the door. You can see the, the, the pad to do that. Anyway, so it might seem like the thing you should do is basically lock them all up, right? But as it turns out, People with ADHD do badly when the, there's too much going on around them and also when there's too little going on around them. So you have to hit that sweet spot, spot. just like an average human, a regular old human out there needs to be a sort, uh, sort of um, uh, general, um, generally energized but not over-energized um, state. So with um, when you're thinking about distractions for people with ADHD. You can think about the usual things like, you know, sight lines and sounds, but you have to really put on your thinking cap here, you know, because all sorts of things can um, uh, distract people with ADHD, like if the temperature isn't quite right. Like, you know, I don't have ADHD. If the temperature isn't quite right, you know, like I maybe walk over once and I try to reset the thermostat, whatever, then I go back to work, right? Uh, my husband actually is an adult with ADHD. He would never let that go. You know, if he was distracted by the temperature, he would adjust and adjust and readjust till it was exactly right. And um, that can take up a lot of time. And if you're paying somebody to work for you, you really don't want them to spend multiple hours in their day filling with the, the thermostat. Um, but, but they can't ignore that because if they do, it's very stressful to them. And lots of these conditions that I'm talking about, like giving people control and alignment with the task at hand and things like that, they matter not only in and of themselves, but also because they affect stress levels. Because a lot of these conditions actually are worsened when people experience stress. When my husband is stressed for some reason or another, all the sort of less than positive aspects of having ADHD uh, come out in him a lot more. So um, again, if we're thinking about just to move through, um, people with ADHD can have problems with organization. You want to provide organizational aids to people. Uh, but you, when you're helping people with organization, you want to make sure that distractions are truly eliminated from view. If you set up some complex filing system, but people can see into those drawers because the walls are transparent or whatever, you have not accomplished very much that will remain a distraction. Um, you need uh, 
to block views of, of, of things through organizational systems as well. Um, you have to um, think about visual complexity. Again, you want to tone things back with people with ADHD, just like you do with people with um, autism. It's actually interesting. There's some research going on in the, in the psych world now about how maybe, although autism and ADHD actually present very differently in the world out, out there, maybe autistic brains and ADHD brains are a lot more simi similar chemically than has previously been thought. So anyway, an interesting aside. Um, work um, surface based task lighting actually helps with people with ADHD. It sounds like a mean joke, but if you actually focus the light on whatever they're supposed to be doing, it helps them to do it. While you're focusing that light, you want to use cooler colored light as opposed to warmer light. Cooler colored light helps people in general concentrate, so a bonus for everybody. White noise seems to be particularly useful with um, to people with um, ADHD, but it can benefit all of us. Um, and so uh, people with ADHD are also particularly uh, concerned um, uh, or, or particularly benefited by access to nature and being around green spaces, and, but having views of natural things, plants, etc. People with ADHD, it won't surprise you to learn, often um, move around to burn off um, energy. So it can be, um, my husband actually has stories about like before having to make big presentations. He once worked in a, a building, high rise building with lots of stairs. Like he'd go run up and down stairs for a while just to burn off energy. But anyway, um, in, a, in a more usual context, people can benefit by having things like sit stand desks and that, and that kind of thing. I'm going to talk briefly about dyslexia. People with dyslexia have difficulty processing and remembering information they see and that they hear. Um, and um, the upside of this is uh, people with dyslexia often have enhanced visual spatial abilities and in particular uh, uh, a, a better ability to think in three dimensions. Something to think about when we're talking about people with dyslexia, it's also relevant to all the other situations we've been talking about, is um, someone who gets into your workforce, you know, in, into one of the workplaces you're um, uh, designing, has actually like been to school and, and, and things like that. They've been out in the world. And particularly if we're thinking about dyslexia, in high school, you know, elementary schools, high schools, universities, et cetera, there are often accommodations made for people who are uh, dyslexic to help them, you know, read and absorb information, things like that. You need to know what sort of accommodations are being provided in your area so you can make sure that your workplace does um, the same sort of things because people expect to find at work what they found at their university and in their high school, for example. Um, and, and you also are always wanting to build in control and flexibility again, because sometimes people who are dyslexic, just like people who have ADHD, et cetera, sometimes these people have come up with their own sorts of accommodations, idiosyncratic fixes, um, uh, things they, they do. So you want to make sure they can act on those if it's at all possible. Um, people with um, dyslexic or who are dyslexic can have trouble wayfinding like the rest of us, but again, be particularly concerned about uh, wayfinding. Um, they can have issues with organization. And dyslexia, dyslexia is in particular significantly affected by stress. So, you know, that weird little sound that happens every so often but that the copy machine makes, whatever, you know, that's going to be a particular issue with people with dyslexia. Um, we're getting towards the end of our time. So we're going to talk about the last few issues relatively uh, quickly so we have a chance to get to some questions. Um, we're going to talk about personality, personality now. Everybody likes when we get to personality because everybody is curious about everybody else. They don't want anybody to know anything about them, but they'd really like to know everything about everyone else. Uh, so when I'm talking about personality today, I'm going to be talking as in the context of what's known as the big five uh, personality system. Um, and um, 
as I name each of the factors in the big five, I'll give you like a phrase to describe them. Uh, the one that everybody has heard of is extroversion, introversion. Extroverts are really energized by the world around them, where introverts have a richer inner life and are more likely to be um, uh, get energy from within themselves. And spaces that um, uh, are put together by um, people who are extroverted tend to really support socializing, for example. Um, the next one we could think about would be um, openness to experience. Again, surprise, surprise, that's the name sort of is right on. People who are open to experience are more into novel uh, uh, experiences, situations, um, where people who score at the other end of the spectrum are more interested in, in traditional ones. Um, people who are conscientious, again, surprise, they're uh, particularly interested, people who score particularly high on being conscientious are particularly concerned about cleanliness, neat lit, neatness, keeping things up to date, tidy, you know, that has like material selection. Uh, repercussions. Um, uh, uh, people who are agreeable, that means they um, uh, relates to how they interact with others and like, um, how accommodating they might be to others. Uh, people who are agreeable, as it turns out, aren't as materialistic as, as the rest of us. And um, the last of the big five is technically known as neuroticism. Neuro being neurotic is a term that's got all sorts of baggage on it. You can really think about it as emotional stability. In the US, it can now be a real problem in a workplace to test for personality. You know, uh, things happen like people don't get a promotion and uh, they'll go and complain to the human resources department or the um, or just hire a lawyer saying like, uh, the, the, the basis of the suit is something like, I didn't get this promotion because they found out 10 years ago when I joined the organization that I'm not open to experience or um, uh, I'm not conscientious, as, as conscientious as some other people, for example. So uh, testing is at a standstill often in the United States. That doesn't mean you can't design for personality because there have also been many dissertations over the years that develop personality profiles for different sorts of occupations. Like I just had to find out the usual personality profile of emergency medical technicians, like the people who drive around in the ambulances. And lo and behold, I went to this resource called scholar.google.com. Again, that's scholar.google.com. And did this really complex search that was something like personality profile in, that, in quotation marks and emergency medical technicians in quotation marks and found out all about EMTs. So you can do that also. And your life is made easier by the fact that people with similar personality profiles tend to do the same sort of jobs. So it's a stereotype, but you'll find that like most um, uh, salespeople actually are extroverted, for example. So again, the most um, extensively researched aspect of um, personality um, and design relates to extroversion and introversion. And when you get right down to it, the bottom line is people who are extroverted um, uh, do better, prefer, perform better in an environment that's slightly more stimulating. That means they can do a little better around other people, et cetera, where people who are more introverted will prefer and do better in a more carefully curated uh, environment. So, you know, the research shows, uh, for example, that um, introverts are more in favor of private offices and um, least prefer open plan type situations. And that's a finding from a study done by somebody in the room, Nigel, Nigel Olson here. Um, also, people who are uh, extroverted, for example, prefer uh, more saturated colors. There's a number of different factors you can tie to extroversion and introversion. And I have to show you this. Um, I was in Milan about three weeks ago and walking along the sidewalk, uh, basically minding my own business, when I walked by the home store for Dolce and & Gabbana. And uh, this is what they had in their window. And I love it. I am a very extroverted. I love all those saturated colors. I love all those patterns, all that stuff going on. Um, 
And by the way, the fact that I love this doesn't necessarily mean that I would work well in this space, but I actually love it. Um, I mean, like, truly I do. And I know that I didn't even bother to show this to my very introverted husband because he would just, he would roll his eyes. He, he, he can't even, and it was worse nightmare. He can't imagine anything worse than this in our house. But, you know, I really do like it. And, you know, like in our house, I generally have to tone things back because, you know, it's, it's better for me to be in a place that's got a little less going on than I enjoy than for somebody else to be overwhelmed by the environment. But anyway, I had to show you this and I actually hung out for a while so I could photograph it through the window just right without glare. I'm sure they thought I was up, going to come back and steal something in the night. But anyway, you know, if we think about some of the other aspects of personality, we've already talked a little bit about openness to experience and preference for more traditional or more out there sort of options, um, uh, conscientiousness and uh, interest in, in things that help them um, organize, uh, things that seem tidy, et cetera. Um, uh, we've talked about agreeableness a little bit and materialism, but also like fascinatingly, people who are relatively more agreeable are more into more representational art, like uh, impressionist art, for example, than, than, than others. Uh, people who are um, uh, neurotic, um, which again is um, less in a less value laden way called emotional stability. Uh, they prefer larger personal spaces, so they're stressed when people come closer um, uh, than other people might be. Um, uh, they're quite averse to stress in general, if you think about environmental stimuli. Uh, interestingly, you know how. We also hear all the time that um, uh, to be mentally refreshed, people need to look at nature and stuff like that. Well, people who are, have less emotional stability can be refreshed by looking at the most, you know, a, an urban scene, for example. So lots of interesting things to think about there. And also people are, who are um, on the neurotic scale can be concerned um, about making eye contact with other people. So again, you want to build in flexibility in terms of chair orientation, different seating options, and ability and put things in the environment like aquariums or something, to which people having a conversation could gracefully divert their eyes from time to time so it wasn't obvious they were looking away from whoever they were talking with. Very briefly, I want to talk about national culture and language because these influence what you pick out of a space. As it turns out, people uh, who grew up in the West really attend to the focal element in any scene that they see, where people who grew up in the Far East pay attention to a scene more holistically. So um, this is in Hawaii. If I ever disappear uh, forever, come to this, you know, start to look around Maui. When you find this gazebo, you will have found me. But as somebody from uh, who grew up in the Western world, yep, um, I'm going to move even faster now. Um, uh, I look at that gazebo, right? I'm into that. Like, that's what I pay attention to. Someone who grew up in a different part of the world would attend to the whole scene. So how would this come into play? Like if you, let's, we just all had lunch, right? So let's think about like kitchens, right? If you're designing a kitchen, you know, it's going to be, uh, you're going to be selling mainly to people from the West. Put your money into that refrigerator and the stove. That's what someone from the West will pay attention to. If you think your buyers might be from the Far East, you know, you have to be concerned about the refrigerator and the stove, but you have to pay more attention to the backsplash and the kinds of uh, uh, cabinets and things like that, because someone from the Far East will attend to all of these elements when they're making that initial assessment of the situation and first impressions really are strong. Also, in terms of language, the language that you speak first influences how you experience spaces for the rest of your life. For example, um, there are some languages where nouns have a gender and some they don't. If uh, you have grow up speaking a language where something or other is masculine, you find the best form of that thing to conform to all sorts of, again, male stereotypes. Like you think uh, the thing should be sort of stronger uh, looking, um, uh, 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 you know, um, more substantial, et cetera. 
and if you grew up thinking, in a, uh, speaking a language where that thing uh, was viewed as a feminine noun, you expect it to be more graceful, for example, to conform to other female stereotypes. So think about how this might come up into play. Say you're showing somebody like a chair or whatever, right? And um, uh, like you present the aspects of the chair or whatever, and the person you're talking to basically says, that just isn't right. Like, it's not a chair, you know, like that's wrong. And, and it, but if you can get around to finding out where they, what they might have spoken first, you may find out that like you're showing them a chair that conforms to like male stereotypes, it may have more straight lines, et cetera, but they grew up thinking of chairs as feminine. So they want that chair to be more graceful. So this all impacts how people interpret information. Also, um, you would think that people all over the world design, divide up colors in the same way. No, they don't. Like even in Japan until the, uh, the occupation after the second world war, um, blue and blues and greens were talked about with the same sort of adjectives. And that's the reason why today, when you go to Japan, the traffic, the green traffic light, uh, isn't as green as you might be expecting from home. It's more of a turquoise, a blend of blue and green. And, um, Last, lastly, we're going to talk about how expertise comes into play. Um, as you got your design training, uh, you were exposed to more things like more colors, more sorts of forms, etc. You became familiar with more things. Familiarity drives preference. So something that someone without design training might look at going like, oh my God, like oh, I hate that color, whatever. Uh, no, you might not because you're, you've become much more familiar with a range of colors and this would affect your um, processing of sensory information. So if we think about this, uh, when we try to integrate this and take this overwhelming, and we've only talked about the really highest highlights of only some of the possible what differences in sensory processing, but you can see that to actually deal with this information, well, it's impossible. But when you start to think about these 10 tenets of effective workplace design, you realize that working through them creates a space where everybody can perform to their full potential for, uh, because, for example, they have um, a choice and can control where they actually, the conditions where they actually go to work. And um, uh, if you're thinking you have limited resources, in order to deal with the spaces you're creating. The single most important thing you can do is to get the acoustics right, because across all these conditions, um, acoustics can be a significant stressor, just as they are to people in general. So again, to create a space uh, where everybody um, performs to their full potential, that where uh, they live pleasant lives while they do so, um, create a, just a good space in general, and you'll 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 find everybody is um, is 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 thriving there. Now, um, I'm uh, happy to answer questions now, or um, you can be in touch later. So, what sort of questions do we have? Okay, thank you very much, and Martin, if you can make sure your microphone's on in the room, that will be good. Uh, we do have some questions, uh, Sally. Thank you very much for that. Uh, someone has asked about, have you looked at the area of virtual as well? Uh, and how The area of what? I'm sorry, the area of what? Virtual, well, being online. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, the same sorts of uh, issues would be of concern in the virtual world and is the real world. Um, you know, it, it, again, this is a popular dissertation topic and basically study after study after study shows that the sorts of ish, uh, uh, concerns that we might have in the real world carry over in, into, into, into the, into the virtual world. Um, so, um, you know, um, it, it, a, a um, virtual environment to be used by people who are likely to be on the autistic uh, spectrum should um, uh, not have much visual complexity, not have much going on, as much going on visually, just as an example. So, you know, from real to virtual, same people, same brains, et cetera. <laughs> 
Thank you. So, Martin, if you could close the slide deck, uh, I've stopped the sharing for you. Uh, are there any questions in the room as well? If so, uh, I will come back to them. But Sally, I'm going to ask you one more question from sure. Adrian. Ad Adrian is asking, do you, is there a really good office you've seen that's been well designed for neurodiversity? Um, you know, I actually, um, I don't have one particular space to tell you, but I'm also leery of answering that question just in general because often people design uh, really appropriately with the best of intentions using all the various research and, and things like that. And then something or other will get value engineered out of a space. So something that I might, uh, you know, not, not praise or actually might criticize actually uh, turns out to be a situation where somebody really, really tried to do the right thing based on the research, et cetera, and, and wasn't able to, 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 to do that. Um, I don't know your name, um, but- Can you make sure you get the microphone first, to, please? Yeah, you're not supposed to speak without the microphone, so <laughs> God help you. <laughs> Hi, Sally, thanks so much for that. Um, I'm Kate, I run a company called RestSpace. Um, my question's really about metrics and like understanding how to get feedback from the space to improve on it and make it more suitable. Have you seen any good examples of that? Or do you have any suggestions? Um, there's a number of different things that, that you can do, but hooking people up to different machines is um, unlikely to be the way to go in many cases because just the fact of being monitored can influence experience. I think um, if you're able to do some one-on-one -on -one interviewing with select individuals who are, are likely to um, uh, be thought leaders, for example, in a group, that that can be a really good use of your time. But there are also, like if you go to scholar.google.com and actually type in what's of most concern to you at this moment, you might find that somebody has already like written a dissertation you know, or done a master's thesis project on what intrigues you so that might provide you with the material that that, that you need and now to nigel hi sally thank you um gosh you covered a lot of ground there didn't you um, got to talk fast <laughs> from near near new york it all helps <laughs> um, two-part question yes uh -oh. and, and i'll answer i'll ask it in two parts the, okay. the first one is have you come across any research on preferences for those with ocd um no, I, I, I haven't seen that researched, but based on um, what I know about OCD, I would imagine uh, that the spaces for those individuals would be very similar to the optimal spaces for people with ADHD. And it's also true that um, regularly people who have ADHD also have OCD, so it would make sense that there would be consistencies right. there. I think you, you, in the big five, you mentioned conscientiousness, so may, maybe there's something there as well. Yeah, yeah, there could be. Yeah. But conscientious might not be, uh, even the most conscientious person might not be carried to the extreme of OCD. Yeah, yeah. But they might be close. <laughs> yeah. So, so my follow-up question, <laughs> this one's a little bit more sensitive, I've got to be careful. Um, uh -oh. So. Uh, we, we know, for example, with architects, designers, you might see higher rates of dyslexia. Yeah, uh, sometimes. And I wondered if you might see higher rates of OCD. But the broader question then is, do those traits then affect how designers design spaces? Yeah, they have to. Um, uh, th because people would be designing a space in which they could anticipate somebody would be comfortable and um, there, um, I'm, I'm actually looking up a specific statistic that I didn't say out loud. Um, here we go. Um, uh, so uh, architects and interior designers, probable personality profile would influence the spaces they create. So you really have to make a big effort to design for something that might not align with your personality. And um, Somebody um, did a study in 2011, and he used the Myers-Briggs system. You know, you guys have all heard of Myers-Briggs, right? And he found out that um, architects, 31% uh, of architects had the profile ENTJ, but that was only 
uh, true of 1.8% of the population in general. So you don't have to really worry about ENTJ too much. I just bring it up now. It, well, I mean, you do because people design for their personality, as I was mentioning. But I bring it up now to uh, su confirm, support the point that Nigel's making about how maybe an architect interior design personality profile doesn't line up exactly with the population at large. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to take a, give you a question online, uh, which is, is personality nature or nurture? Oh, uh, well, Nigel and I will now begin to speak. We will speak on this topic for about the next four hours. Anybody who needs to use the restroom or whatever may wish to go now. Um, but um, I think it, it really is to some extent a, mi uh, a mixture of both. Um, uh, I can say I've seen some interesting studies about how personality profiles of people in the United States tend to differ, differ from uh, the personality profiles of their uh, relatives who stayed in Europe. And um, people think that this might be because individuals with particular profiles were happier, like, you know, going across the ocean and then going like across deserts and things like that. Uh, then you know, some people were more comfortable doing that than other people. And um, personality differences can persevere because to some extent they are um, inherited. But I think to a certain extent, um, personality profiles that people exhibit are also, can also be linked to what they're rewarded for, for example, which gets more to nurture. Um, you know, if um, uh, my mother would praise me for going to parties or whatever, I might, um, uh, think more about going to parties and to some extent, very slightly, live in a different uh, personality and uh, become adjusted to a, a, a different lifestyle, whatever. Because in a, in a way, we don't really care what people's, we don't, we don't have to really totally fixate on what people's personality scores are. We have to think about how they choose to live their lives. So.